How about now? Do we have sound? Yes. There we go. I can tell. All righty. I can't hear you. No sound, no sound, no sound. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Good to go. Sometimes I, I put that little thing in the slot and it just doesn't, it just doesn't catch. So welcome. Welcome, everybody. Thank you once again for, uh, I should pull this over so you can see it. It's quite, quite beautiful, my, uh, my, uh, my singing bowl that I have. It's a good way to start, uh, start satsang. So thanks you all for being here. Wonderful to have, uh, have people from all around the world stopping in on their, on their Sunday. Chuck in Florida, David and Elaine from uh, the UK. Hello, folks. Florida for Billy Boy too. Carrie from Castro Valley, California. Wow, I lived in Fremont for many years. Had many, many friends in Hayward and uh, Castro Valley. Wonderful to have you, Carrie. Ava from Poland is here. Ivan from Bulgaria is here. Oh, yay. Welcome, 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 everybody. Um, somebody from, who's it? Yes, good to go, good to go. New York City, Curtis from New York City. I was just living there, too. Emiliano from Sweden, California. Inner Aesthetics is from California. Robert from Southern Nevada. Uh, I can't pronounce that name. Yev, Yevgenli, Yevgenli from Indiana. Johanna from Mexico, Catherine from London in the UK. Hi, everybody. Well, I called this, I called this uh, particular satsang Truth versus Belief. Um, I'm actually putting together a class to talk a lot about that, especially within the, or within the subject of, uh, oh, come on, go back up again, especially within the, the subject of lack and scarcity, which is um, which is a belief and not a truth. Um, you see, the thing about here's the here's the difference. You want to know the difference between truth and a uh, what happened? Skip. You want to know the difference between truth and uh, a belief. The belief requires a believer. The truth does not. The truth is true whether you or anybody believes it or not. A belief requires somebody to believe it to be true. So the, the real ultimate, the real uh, uh, power, the real authority always lies with the truth because it is self-existent, it is self-luminous, it is self-sustaining, it, and it doesn't need, and, it's, and it is true whether anybody believes it or not. And so a belief, though, on the other hand, can be dead wrong. But if it is believed strongly enough, um, it actually gets believed into existence. If enough people believe it, you can have an entire world, countries, world, states, all running and implementing and manifesting a belief that is simply not true. I mean, it's amazing to think about it. So the big question, the question we love to, I love to take up in satsang is, how do we actually distinguish what's true? You see, you, you can't rely on the appearances around you. You can't rely on your experiences, on conditions, um, on <laughs> friends and neighbors. You can't rely on any of that because... We manifest whatever our belief is, whether it's true or not. If, if our thoughts and our emotions are aligned with truth, the manifestation, the experience, what gets believed into existence uh, is a manifestation of the truth. So you have, to kind of, you have to put aside all the ways in which we normally discern it is something true. If I see it, it must be true, right? Well, there it is, I can see it. But it's been proven over and over and over again that our perceptive abilities are, are, are totally warped. They're totally distorted. That we see really what we believe 
uh, more than uh, more than believe what we see. That the belief actually comes first. So what I always like to do is to is to point the attention back to the to the one place that we know for sure, <laughs> right? The one truth that we know, and that is our own existence and the nature of that existence. You know, you hear me say over and over and over and over again that, that you are consciousness, that consciousness is your nature, and that consciousness is not a function of matter. Although it is universally believed that it is, um, there's, there has been absolutely nothing shown in the brain uh, or all the places that have been looked at for the seat of consciousness that indicate consciousness. The brain has all sorts of different functionings, functions going on. There's absolutely nothing in any structure, in any part of the body, that has the quality or characteris characteristic, uh, characteristics of self-awareness. So it is just assumed, without being proven, it hasn't even become a hypothesis. It never even went through the scientific method to prove whether it was true or not. It's just assumed that since I'm conscious and I have a sense I am, that it must be some kind of product in the brain. Which means it's nothing more than a robot. And, and the sense of self, the sense of existence, the sense of I am, is an illusion. <laughs> of course, it's strange, an illusion to whom? <laughs> right? <laughs> you see, all of our scientific method and our philosophies and our, the way in which we approach knowing what truth is, uh, s scripture and you know, historic accounts and all of the ways in which we try to discern what is actually true, none of them work here. <laughs> none of those methods are, are capable of discerning the nature of consciousness. And the reason I say that is because consciousness is a totally subjective experience. It's the one thing you experience that is not phenomenal. That is, you know, everything else, there's you as the subject, the perceiver, and then the object that is perceived, which is the, which is the object, right? So in every single a relationship. There's me and there's my perception of, of an object, right? So you can make an objective. You can try to make an objective claim that I can, I can try to examine that object uh, to find its characteristics outside of my sense of perception. But you can't do that with consciousness. <laughs> you cannot do that with consciousness. You have to first, because consciousness is subjective. It is non-phenomenal. It's the only thing you experience ever that is not a phenomena, that is not an appearance of something else. Your experience of consciousness is intimate, it's internal, it is intuitive, it is, it is not a subject and object relationship. And because it isn't a subject and object relationship, because you are the subject and consciousness is the only thing you ever experience, um, you cannot examine it through any of the intellectual or scientific or technological tools we have for exploring the world, the world around us. So if we're going to know what the truth is, that's where we have to go. It's almost like a different kind of science that we have to come up with, a subjective science rather than an objective science. Um, we have to and, of course, bearing in mind that the capacity of the human mind for self-deception is virtually off the charts. There's no limit to it, right? So how, then, do we discern what's actually true? Well, since I have discerned that, that number one, I am conscious, that without consciousness, uh, meaning, existence has no, has no meaning, right? 
<laughs> existing without consciousness, I, I mean, it's like it's inconceivable, right? It, it, you know, it'd be like a rock, you know, so what? It is the consciousness, aware of being, that makes the sense of being possible at all. So that's where I go. I go to the sense of being because it is the one thing I know of that I don't need any kind of external validation that it is. I know that I am. Now that's not saying I know what I am, okay? Just let's put that aside for a second. Let's just get to the most fundamental place we can get to, and that is the self-evident truth that I exist, that I am, and I'm conscious of existing. Consciousness is a reality. It is not an illusion, because there'd have to be something conscious to be delu <laughs> to, <laughs> to have an illusion, right? So it, 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 consciousness, it, it, even if it's completely self-deceived, cannot be self-deceived about its own existence. So that's where I start. Consciousness is real. And I can go from there because without consciousness, being has no meaning. It's undefined. It's like division by zero. I can say that consciousness is what I am. That is the, it is the most rarefied, most subtle, most succinct way uh, of identifying myself. Consciousness is what I am, because without that, there's no experience, there's no life, there's no being, there's, there's nothing. Everything I experience is experienced through the medium, this vehicle of consciousness. And while the what I experience is changing constantly, the experience of experiencing remains absolutely consistent, absolutely the same. So I simply go there. I go to what I know. And I say, hmm, all I know is this sense of experience. And somebody actually asked the question. I'm going to go back here and find it. Um, let me get right back here. Oops. I lost my train here. Hold on. My channel... There we go. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, we got a hello from Herefordshire in, in the UK. Hello, Sophie. Um, beautiful satsang to everybody from Louisiana. It's Ishta. Uh, G. Guraman, hello, GP. Great to see you again. Why people can see the same? Why people can see the same on TV? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Big hug quite sure what the question is. Starlight Glimmer, hello GP. What does it mean to end the reincarnation cycle? If we're all one, does it just mean realizing that none of our lives have been real or something like that? Um, yeah, that's pretty close. That's pretty close, Starlight. It's from Starlight Glimmer. Um, yeah, when you realize that, that the body and the world and all of experience appears and disappears in consciousness and is made of consciousness, um, then there's no longer a sense of incarnating in a body. You're, the, the sense of being, the sense of existence, what I was talking about earlier, the sense of consciousness, becomes the constant, and bodies appear and disappear, just like every night you lose this body, um, and you have a dream, and you have another body in the dream. The dream and the body is totally subjective in the dream, and, and you don't think of yourself as going to sleep at night and then incarnating. You know, I'm going to get into that body. We see it as simply uh, an experience. It's the way consciousness experiences things. It, it appears to be that we're conscious of it from the inside out, when in fact, it's actually the outside in. You, the, that which is appearing is like a dream. And so, and so uh, the... Incarnation, incarnation, reincarnation, <laughs> and uh, are all are all based on the premise that there's some that consciousness is or is like a soul. It's a thing, right? And it goes in and inhabits a body. 
Now, whether you believe that consciousness is a structure in the body and that someday we're going to find this little, this little thing in the brain that, ah, there it is. Ooh, I've been found, right? Um, or it's, it's a more ephemeral thing, like a soul that enters into the body and then leaves the body. We're going to see that all of those are simply uh, an appearance, a movie, appearing in the screen of consciousness. And you're not getting into a body or out of a body ever. A bo bodies and world, and entire worlds, appear and disappear. They, I mean, there's no guarantee that uh, the next body that appears is going to be on Earth, right? <laughs> it could be a completely different universe because the entire thing is happening within, within consciousness. So, um, it's true, none of your lives have really been you. They've simply been a series of experiences that you had and different f instruments that you've played. It's like in one lifetime you played a piano, another one you played the flute, another one you, you, uh, you, know, you played the, uh, the oboe, and another one you were a drummer. Right? They're just different. And so the, the experience will be different. Right? The entire range of experience will be different, including the body, the friends, the people, the, uh, uh, everything. But none of it is happening objectively. It is all phenomena occurring within this indescribable field of, of, of self-aware uh, consciousness. So I, I hope that answers your question, Starlight. Remington says, hi, GP, no questions. Kind of a lot of mixed emotions. Just hope I get the answer that I need. Um, just drop the desire for an answer as if there's some kind of definitive aha moment awaiting that's just out of your gra grip. And just let yourself sink into this present moment as if this present moment was complete in and of itself. If there's a sense I need an answer, just let that be there. But recognize that sense itself is, is in essence, the appearing of the answer. Because there can't be an answer without a question. They have to appear simultaneously. The way we experience questions and answers, or desires and fulfillment, um, if you want to go that far with it, is that something arise we we experience it over time right it unfolds um, in manifestation over time the reality is that question and answer are actually simultaneous um, a desire and the fulfillment of that desire they are simultaneous they are two uh, aspects two sides of the same coin so if you if you see the feeling of, of, of um, you need an answer is there, you can recognize that the, it's, it's the fact that there is an answer that pushed the question to the surface. And so the, the two of them are actually one. And you can just sit back in this place of equanimity without the sense of, of having, a, without a sense of lack, without lacking an answer. That's the problem. When a desire arises or a question arises, because of our conditioning and our belief in lack, we see the, the fulfillment of the desire or the answer to the question as being as that we are lacking it and somehow it's got to, it's got to fill us up. It's got to uh, come to us. If you just put that aside, because that feeling of lack makes us graspy. That's the nature of attachment. We're... You know, we feel like we're missing something. Well, that feeling that you're missing something is an illusion. It's not true. It's a belief, right? Now, if, you, if as I started this this particular satsang, whatever you believe strongly enough, you literally believe into existence. Your the the whole nature of perception shifts to focus your attention on what you believe and filter out the things that contradict it. So it appears as though it's this, it's coming out of this, uh, out of the abyss, and that it's this real objective thing. When in fact, it is simply a molding of perception around, around your beliefs. So, drop that belief in lack. 
recognize that the that the appearance of of a question includes the answer and and then just notice that the feeling of lacking is just a condition pattern in the nervous system take a step back from it don't react to it don't get graspy <laughs> but just be present with it if it's not believed a belief even if if it's been embodied in the nervous system consistently the belief will dissolve because the belief belief unlike truth is not self-sustained it takes your belief in it to sustain it but if your belief in it is withdrawn it cannot sustain itself and it just dissolves so anytime there's a sense of the, something arises that you want something or you need something you got a question about something notice that, that that's very natural for that stuff to arise and it runs into the conditioning which is the belief of lack don't let that cascade into a story don't go along with it don't react but also don't push it away don't try to resist it stay in the place of equanimity the place of total neutrality because that's the, where the truth is right the only truth you know is the truth of your own being that's the only thing you absolutely know for sure so stay with the truth. You don't even have to know the truth about what you're experiencing. Just be the truth. Consciousness, you know, the truth is not something that is known. The truth is what is doing the knowing. The truth is what you are. Right? Truth is the I am. And so that's, that's the place you, you, you stand. And then you watch questions and answers uh, come and go and eventually the questions all just go <laughs> because because it's also simultaneously simultaneous there's there's still an unfoldment there's still learning there's still growth and all of that anyway is that me i went off on that remington i know you didn't have a question but i made one for you anyway um Saab, hi there Saab in paris chilling in again welcome Saab. great to have you um Yev, Yevgenly, or is it Yevgenly, uh, Ivanov? But is everything not made of consciousness? Yes, yes it is. Um, the reason I, I make a, a, a separation, and the reason most uh, teachers of non-duality do, uh, is, is because we, we have to, we have to, before we can start seeing all the objects around us as made of consciousness uh, as conscious be consciousness being their essential nature we must first discover that consciousness is our essential nature so that we're not talking about consciousness like it's an object like it's a thing that i'm here with this body and i've got this consciousness thing going on um, so when that is established and that's established by going, really by the neti neti. I'm not that, I'm not that, I'm not that. By not identifying with the body, by not identifying with thoughts, by not identifying with emotions, by not identifying with memories and associations and circumstance and experiences, and noticing that all of those are phenomenal, they, they're just phenomena that come and go, but that you are not phenomenal, you, you finally, eventually, completely divorce the sense of self from all of the things that it has become identified with, and you're left with nothing but the pure, spaceless, timeless, birthless, and deathless awareness that you actually are. But realizing that, this stuff doesn't go away. Right? But if I'm that... Well, then what is all of this? The attention naturally turns back outward again to discover the nature of, of experience itself. And now, but now, from this place, this immovable place of pure awareness that you are, you, you don't actually go back out. You, you bring in. It's kind of the opening of the heart of awakening as opposed to the mind of awakening, the, the, is the, you know, the, the vision, the, the, the deep seeing. And then you discover something very interesting and very, really quite amazing. I mean, you could refer to the, a wooden table, right? Like this table here, right? And you could say the table is made of wood, right? But it's weird because 
take away the wood, do you have a table? <laughs> you can't say the table is made of wood. You have to say the table is wood. So it's not like there's a, a table thing somewhere and that now we're making wood to be that table. Take away the table, and, or take away the wood and there's no table. But take away the table and the wood is just isn't got any particular form at all. This is what Buddhism is referred to as the emptiness. The, the, the table is empty of any characteristics. So you cannot separate the wood from the table. And that's the direction it starts to go. You cannot separate consciousness from the objects of consciousness. So you can't say that this is a glass case made out of consciousness. You say this is consciousness. And and then the, the the unity of of consciousness and the and the content of consciousness becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. So does that um, help with your oops? Come on down. Does that help with your your question, Yevgeny? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm butchering your name. Uh, Chris Gills says, "What is real GP?" I know everything is a dream state, but what is the ultimate real thing? You. <laughs> the ultimate real thing is you. The only real thing is you. But eventually you see that the, the real thing is not only just you, separate from everything else, it's you including everything else. As I started this thing talking about truth versus belief, go to the one thing you know for sure, for sure. It's simple, it's humble, it's overlooked. <laughs> it, it doesn't seem like it's very important to the mind. But go to the one thing you know for sure. The one thing that does not require any external validation. You do not need to have anybody approve of your opinion about it. You know for a fact that you exist. But you don't know it objectively. You don't know it because I can see myself standing over there. You know it non-phenomenally. Muji refers to it as non-phenomenal recognition. You are simply recognizing your existence. It's effortless. It's, it's, it, it's constant. <laughs> Nobody needs to confirm it for you. So that's truth. That is self-existent self-luminous, self-validating truth. So truth is not a thought, it's not a concept, it's not an idea. It's Truth is the nature of existence itself. Existence, truth, same thing. Being in consciousness, same thing. Your existence is consciousness. It is not something that has consciousness. Consciousness and being are one. Consciousness is the nature of existence. And, and that is real. That is the ultimate real. Everything else is an appearance. And, you know, that, that's not just from m the model that I talk about, the consciousness-only model. If you talk to a phys physicist, I mean, they're still looking for the fundamental particle of which everything else is an appearance. Everything we see here is an appearance of something smaller. Right? The, the body, which is made up of all these organs and cells, and the cells are made up of organic molecules, and the molecules are made up of atoms, and the atoms are made up of subatomic particles, and quarks, and quantum, and on and on and on it goes. At every level, it is simply an appearance, a phenomena of a lower level, and scientists keep probing, trying to find that which, from which it is all originated, that is not a phenomenon. A phenomena. That which is actually truth, self-existent, the ultimate particle. Well, to me, that it's self-evident. I've already found it. They've been looking in all these places. I found it. It's my own, is the sense of my existence, is the, is the only thing that we can validate as being truth. The only thing that is self-existent is truth. That's real. But because that is real, it doesn't make all of this unreal. It doesn't make it objective. And this is such an important point. Because Buddha said a lot of things 
a lot of things that were very mysterious to people, like it both exists and does not exist. This is what he's referring to. Right? The, we can say the table exists, but the table only exists as a temporary combination of various elements, the legs, the wood, you know, everything that w went into it. You take it, this and, all de and destroy it, the table does not exist anymore. So the table, like a dream at night, right? The dream you have, the people in your dream, they exist, you have interaction with, interaction with them, and yet they don't exist. I always use, like to use the example of cartoon characters, right? We all know, we can all have a long conversation about Bugs Bunny or, you know, f you know fictional characters in b books or movies or, like, you know, um, Har Harry Potter, right? We can talk about Luke Skywalker. We could talk at, at length about, about it in the universe and all the things and all the people they interact with and all the experiences they had and yet they don't exist. So they both exist and do not exist. So. The existence means it's not objective. It doesn't exist independently of the consciousness that is perceiving it. And the perception itself is, is a phenomenon. It's simply a perception. It's changing. But in that moment of perception, it exists. And existence, when you look at existence and you don't look at it um, objectively, like it's an objective thing um, that exists independently of your perception of it, you see, the original meaning of the word existence, it comes from the Latin, I think it's existari, which simply means to stand out from, right? So, you know, this glass case I have stands out from the, from the background. If I, you know, pushed it all the way back far enough, it would disappear into the background. That's all it means. It comes into relief, that is, it becomes a, a form and then can disappear into form. It does not mean something that has permanent existence. When I talk about real existence or truth, I'm talking about that which has eternal existence, that is always true, that never becomes anything other than true, and that is completely self-sustained. So does that uh, do it for you, Chris? Dave and Elaine, is the sense of being a separate self the natural result of the usual conditioning that occurs around us after the birth of the physical body? Or are there other factors to consider? No, it's quite natural. It, it, it's, quite, it's quite natural. It, it's simply the way the nervous system processes the information. And I wish it wasn't that way. <laughs> but of course, you know, according to every spiritual teacher I've ever listened to that was worth anything, they always said the same thing. Um, uh, and, and that is... I just completely lost my train of thought. When these little things pop up on the screen, they kind of just, they, they, they distract me for a, for a second. What all the teachers say is that this really has to happen because this is the impetus that draws us, that brings us to awakening. That if that doesn't happen, um, the, the awakening doesn't occur. And so it is a natural phenomena that, you know, when the child... The infant, um, really up to around two years, two years of age, there's is completely undifferentiated. You know, you, me, this, that, my hand, your hand, no sense of that whatsoever. There's no memories. There's no concepts. There's no ideas. There's no perceptions. Really, it is direct experience, unbuffered and unfiltered, with no no objects of mind around it. So it is just pure experience. <clears throat> Well, at some point in that experience, um, it starts running into a conflict with the environment. You know, it can be something as extreme as abuse, or it can be just as natural as somebody grabbing your hand before you stick the fork in the light socket, right? Which, you know, you have to do. But there's all of a sudden, there's this sense of, 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 a, of a separation. There's a me and a you, right? There's a sense of separation. And over time, it grows to a sense of, their, of, of an awareness that that sense of separation begins to concentrate itself on the physical form until finally it becomes, I am this body. Now, this is even before there's the thought, I am this body. It's, the nervous system now has begun to organize it around itself around this body. And, that the, and it's different than those bodies. 
And so at that point, the sense of identity, the sense of self, the sense of what's me and what's not me, the sense of what is I'm supposed to be, what I'm not supposed to be, all begins to grow and, and get concentrated in. And so the sense of self, the, the sense of, of self becomes a sense of a separate self, which eventually becomes the sense of a me and an I and the egoic mind. And it's all based on that very subtle but natural sense of, of, of separate. And all we're doing here is turning around and moving back to see that it is, it's not actually true. That the, that the way the nervous system focused its attention and created a sense of identity around the body, we are, by, by bringing our attention back into consciousness, we begin to see that the, that the body is appearing in consciousness. And that's the actual experience. You're con you are conscious of the body. Therefore, the body is an object in consciousness, but we believe the consciousness is in the body. <laughs> and so we just go back to direct experience. And, and in your direct experience is not of being in a body. <laughs> con when you look at consciousness as everything that you're experiencing, you say, well, these hands are in my consciousness. You know, this this screen that I'm talking to you on, that's in my consciousness, the microphone. You guys are in my consciousness. Your questions, the, you know, the questions again, they're all in my consciousness. So where is the actual boundary line? The belief is that the boundary line is your skin and that there are physical senses detecting these things. And that's the foundation. I am this body is the foundation of the conviction that I am the separate self. But when you examine it closely, you find that everything is appearing within the consci in consciousness. And then, if you begin to explore it, you go, well, where is the boundary? And if I did find a boundary to consciousness, wouldn't that too be in consciousness? And if I found a boundary, I'd have to be aware of something on the other side of the boundary. And that too would be in consciousness. So you find you can't actually find a boundary. But this this sense of being the body and confined in the body or even imprisoned in the body is so strong, the conviction, that belief is so strong and so universally held that even as you begin to approach the boundlessness of being consciousness and not the body, um, there's resistance, there's doubts, there's the old habits are still there because the nervous system has organized all of its reactions, its emotions, its sensations, its memories, its, all of it has been organized around this idea of a, the separate self that I am the body. And that, and that idea, that self-image is the heart and soul. That is the separate self, but it doesn't have an objective existence. It's only an idea in the mind. But it's an idea in the mind that the nervous system has organized itself around. So even when you see that it's just an idea in the mind, and even when you can explore in meditations the boundlessness and that you cannot find a boundary to consciousness, and that what you're experiencing is actually in consciousness, not out of it, um, doubt's going to be there. Resistance is going to be is going to be there. Um, it's okay. <laughs> But if you if you begin to trust the truth of what you're seeing, trust your direct experience more than than the, the traditional beliefs that have been installed in you, little by little that will all begin to dissipate, and you'll find the conviction growing that you really aren't. You really are the unlimited, <laughs> eternal consciousness, and you'll see that that in fact is your experience all the time and that the other is a false belief. Does that help you guys? Dale Wiggins says, finally joining you for a live satsang from Boston. Wonderful, glad to have you. Uh, Sanjay says, if consciousness is universal and if I am consciousness, why am I not conscious of other people's minds or perceptions or distant places? Hi, from Pune, India. <laughs> um, Wonderful to have someone here from the motherland, where all of this we're talking about originated. Um, don't mistake the universality for consciousness 
for the content of consciousness. Everything is within consciousness. What we would call their thoughts, my thoughts, um, all of it is within consciousness. The mistake you're making is that you're thinking of your consciousness as localized and that there's another consciousness over there. There's, there's not. What I experience is here, what I experience there, what I experience another planet is all within consciousness. Not my consciousness, not a localized sense of consciousness, but universal consciousness. So the sense of consciousness being localized is not universal consciousness. But you can see that it, that sense of, uh, of it being a localized consciousness is appearing in a bigger environment. It's figure, in a bigger space. That bigger space is universal consciousness. But the only way to experience that is we have to deconstruct the, sense of, the, the false sense of self. That's the only way we can do it. Because you're, you're approaching this question from the point of view of a person who has a consciousness and is trying to expand beyond it. But I'm speaking to you from a place that is consciousness without a person. It is not consciousness that belongs to somebody. It is not someone's consciousness. People say everything has consciousness, you know. These glasses have consciousness. The plants have consciousness. The earth has consciousness. I say, no, it does not. Consciousness has the earth, the planets, all of it. So in order to grasp the non-locality, -loca the spacelessness of, of consciousness, you have to go beyond the idea that there's a, my consciousness and your consciousness. Why can't I hear other people's thoughts and see other people's minds and all of that stuff? Who, do you, who are you referring to when you say I? You look closely and you'll see that it's the self-image that I was mentioning before. That, that you're on, on the path, you've seen the consciousness is bigger than that self-image, but you're still trying to understand consciousness from the point of view of the separate self, and it'll never work. You have to step out of that completely until you see that consciousness is not a person. It doesn't belong to anybody. It's not located someplace in space. As a matter of fact, it isn't in space or time. It is not like it's a fifth dimension or a 25th dimensional thing. There's not some great place you're going to zoom out to and see it all. It is non-dimensional. It does not exist in space or time. Space and time exist in it. So, the question itself can't be answered from the point of view of the person that it, the, the, the semi-awake consciousness um, that, is, that is still identified, there are re still remnants of the identification with the separate self. So consciousness appears to be a, a localized, uh, finite thing existing, I don't know, somewhere a couple inches behind your, behind the, your forehead or, or, or something. So does that help you, Sanjeev? Chris Gills, have you heard Muji say there's action but no act but no action? There's speaking but no speaking. I'm trying to sink myself into this perspective. Any advice, GP? Um, yeah, and they're they're mysterious statements for sure, right? Um, but the more you understand the nature of consciousness itself and that it's not a person the easier, the more natural these statements get. I remember the first time I heard, you know, Buddha saying it both exists and does not exist. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, or neither this nor that nor both nor neither. I said, well, what's left? And I really, really struggled with it um, until eventually I began to understand the true nature of consciousness. And then it's, yes, it makes perfect sense. It, it exists as an object in consciousness, as a perception, as a, as a momentary appearance of consciousness, but it does not exist as an objective entity 
that is self-existence. It is empty of a self. It is empty of any self-existence. And so you can say that there's, you know, Buddha said uh, that in his, in his entire life he's never said a thing. Now, <laughs> I think it's something like 45,000 sutras <laughs> attributed, to, uh, uh, attributed to, to Buddha. Um, I mean, like, that's like three a day from the time of his enlightenment to the time of his death. So, um, but he said, I've never said a thing. When you discern that when we're talking about the I have never said a thing, he's referring to the separate, the sense of a separate self. There's not been a person that has said anything, that has spoken. Consciousness itself is speaking. Now, when you look at it really closely, our, normally we think of speaking as me speaking to somebody else, right? I am saying something, words going out into the atmosphere. But if you look at it as a phenomenon that's happening completely within consciousness, speaking doesn't have the same meaning anymore. It's simply the appearing of a particular thought form, a particular object of consciousness. And since consciousness is, is one and all, it's not speaking to anybody. It is pronouncing. So you can say it, they're speaking, and yet there is not speaking simultaneously. And that's only the way we have to put it for, for it to be presented uh, in a way that the mind can begin to approach it, because, because the mind can only deal with objects. So you can say it's both speaking and not speaking. But, so you, you can now look at it from the point of view of, con of consciousness. It's not really speaking. It is just, it's, just a, it, it's an enunciation. It's an appearing, right? Um, so it, nobody, it's not speaking. There's nobody speaking. But from the perspective, relative perspective of experiencing, we use the word speaking, and since it's the only word we have and it's the best word we have, um, we say, we use the term speaking but not speaking in order to try to capture the, the unity of it. You know, in the pure absolute, the pure oneness, there's nothing to say. <laughs> there are no words, there are no thoughts, there are no impressions. There's no one to say, there's no one to speak, and there's no one to speak to, and there's absolutely nothing that needs to be said. That unity, that essential oneness, that indescribable, ineffable oneness, <sighs> miracle of miracles, mystery of mysteries, manifests itself as the infinite variety of, of form. But the forms never take on an objective status. So it's form, but it's not form. It's sensation, but it's not sensation. Is this getting is this getting clear for you, Chris? Thank you for bringing it up. It's extremely subtle, and it's really deep stuff. And I, hopefully, it's not over the head of of of, of too many of you because it's it, it's pretty deep. If it is, I'll you know I'll I'll bring it back. But I but I think that's the best way to try to. Um, I, I explain that. So does that does that help you, my friend? Dick says, hi. Hey, GP, if I get it right, whatever you can observe is not you, including your body and thoughts. Yes, that's exactly the case. That is um, the... Uh, Rupert Spira calls it the inward-facing path. You know, I, I call that the path of inquiry. That isn't me, right? Now, you're going to eventually see that it is you, but it, 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 the you that it is or is not first has to be transformed. It has to become that you you're referring to has to start referring to the, to the infinite consciousness of I. And the way we do that is by the process of disidentification, because we have identified with our thoughts, our bodies, our memories, our associations, our experiences, our relationships. We've identified with all of that. So we have a self-image of the finite, separate self. That has to be moved away. That identification has to cease. And then we find our true nature as pure, unlimited, self-aware consciousness, the nature of existence it, it, itself. 
so that I'm not my body and mouth gets you there. Then you can turn around and go in the opposite direction, which I re re oftentimes refer to as the tantric, which is now imbuing the entirety of experience with the essence of oneness. So now that you're experiencing objects, but you don't see them as separate from you. You see them as intimate, beyond intimate, right? They don't even have an existence separate from consciousness. Like I said, the table is not made of wood. The table is wood. These glasses are, are not made of consciousness. They are consciousness. And that's the essential oneness that cannot be grasped by the mind at all. That, thank you, Dix. Walt says, hello, GP. Hello, Waltz. Uh, Barbara, happier and more grateful than I've ever been in my life. Now what? <laughs> Winning the Powerball would be nice, but I don't need it. <laughs> um, that It is the mind that asks, now what? Happier and more grateful than I've ever been in my life. That's enough. That's what this is about. The rest will take care of itself. Let that gratitude and happiness sink in so deeply that it is cannot be, uh, it cannot be intimidated or or knocked off center by any condition whatsoever. And then, you know, winning the Powerball could happen. These things can these things can come to you, but you will no longer be suspect uh, su su susceptible to either to either wealth or poverty you'll not be you'll not be um, absorbed in great success or you know wealth winning the powerball or something like that nor will you be intimidated or resistant to a, a downtime all of a sudden you know you lose everything neither one of those will have any impact on the sense of happiness then you're free then life can just come and go and does what it needs to do your desires can arise and be fulfilled because the fulfillment of the desire will not create anything artificial within you. That's why, you know, people really want to have more wealth and prosperity. They want to see through the belief in the lack and all that sort of stuff. It's great, and I'm actually going to be teaching a class about it, but it's we don't want that to happen if the end result is we become now dependent and attached to the to getting our our desires fulfilled and that's what happens you know people get really attached they really want they want to make more and they want to make more and they want to make more um, it, it's okay if a part of your, in your if in your life you're struggling with these things because the the important thing is to become free is to free the sense of happiness from its dependence upon conditions because as long as your happiness and sense of well-being is dependent upon conditions, you are not free. Your emotional state goes up and down with conditions, and you'll spend your whole life trying to do the impossible, which is trying to control conditions. You're trying to make the impermanent permanent, and you can't do it. <laughs> so instead, you become the permanence that is unmovable, and then everything can flow through you and... and um, uh, yeah, through you, to you and through you. So um, so just sink more and more deeply into that happiness. And when something comes up saying, uh, saying I want something, it's okay, right? We're not surprised. Oh, I want, no, desires are very natural for us. Just bring it up, let it be there. Let it, let just, let it be there. And, and again, let your happiness not be dependent upon whether you get that thing or not. Now, not only are you liberated, but so is the desire. It's liberated from being commandeered by the belief of lack. And now, the, the entire world begins to benefit from your, uh, from your freedom. Wow, a lot of questions. Um, let's see here. From the name I can't pronounce, Yevgenli. Yevgenli? Hi, GP. Speaking of the soul, what is then the relationship between this body and consciousness? Why is it that my focal point is through the body and not someone else's? Um, because you've identified with the body. The body is appearing in your consciousness. So 
uh, if you look closely, when you say the word I, you're referring to your body. You're referring to your thoughts, your emotions, and your sensations. You're referring to your memories. You're referring to an image you're holding of yourself. Now, through your spiritual practice and non-dual inquiry, that's become more ephemeral. ephemeral. It's not as solid as it was at one, one time. But we have to become more subtle and nuanced. We have to be, be aware that that, that that belief that I am a separate self, that I am the body, is pretty much programmed into every cell. And that belief is that the body exists independently from me and I am inside of it. Right? It's a, the, exactly the opposite is true. So the, this particular focal point that we have, and you know, you fall asleep, you have a dream, you have a different body, but you, you still have this focal point because you are here. You're at the center of it. And so your experience of, of the universe is going to be as you at the center, right? Consciousness is not spatial. It's not to know that consciousness is infinite. It means that consciousness, you're, you now feel as if you're really, really big. It, you go beyond big and small because it, it, consciousness has nothing to do with space. Now, the mind can't conceive that. Consciousness is not an object. It is not a form. It has no boundaries. It, has no, it is not made of anything else. It is the essential. It is even prior to space and time. So it is timeless and spaceless. It has no dimensions. <laughs> right? So everything you are experiencing is consciousness. So I would just do the meditation of becoming aware, even with the eyes open, that what you're looking at, what it appears to be on the other side of the room, is being experienced right here. And by here, I don't need, mean a point in space and time. I mean right here, where I am, where I am, where the sense of existence is. And then look and see if that sense of existence is actually bounded by the body. It is only a belief that looks at some object and makes it over there rather than here. It's only a belief. In fact, if you looked at it even from the point of view of the body, you never see anything over on the other side of the room. You see everything right here. Boom, it's the eye, goes to the thing. Everything is seen right here. Again, from the perspective of the body, nothing is seen out there at all. It's all seen in here. There's all images which is a representation of out there, out of which we are drawing all sorts of conclusions about its nature. I ask the simple question, what is it that's seeing those thoughts? Is it actually localized? Is it actually in a particular spot in space and time? Look closely, really. Dig into your direct experience and you'll find that it isn't, that it is not in space, that space appears in it. So you don't have to make it look like, oh, I want to, infinite consciousness is like filling all space. No, it is without space. It is without locality. And everything appears in it. And it's a simple shift of perspective. Because you are experiencing everything in consciousness, are you not? <laughs> I mean, that's self-evident. That's your experience. We just don't trust it. We trust our the interpretation of our experience that we were educated into. That I'm here, I'm the body, I have these senses, I'm detecting things over there, it's processing in my, in my brain, and then there's me in this universe. See if that's actually true. See if that's true from your experience. Waltz, if spirituality, spirituality realization is all about the fact that you are one with everything, and you are everything and then and then why is it that every awareness has to realize this, if we are one and the same? A awareness which is in a different body isn't you realizing this is the same as me realizing this. 
Why is it that it is more important for every being to realize this individually when we are one and the same? I find this a little contradicting, and I've been trying to find an answer. Well, I'll try to give you one, Walt. Um, it's a good one. Um, these, these kinds of questions um, are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to answer from the perspective of kind of the, of the reasoning of the mind, of you know com comparing and contrasting uh, uh, objects. The answer lies in understanding the nature of consciousness itself. At the point at which you will understand that there, <laughs> okay, this may go over your, go over some people's heads, that there isn't anyone out there waking up. That the awakening, the experience of the awakening, whether it be you or watching someone else, is also just happening in consciousness. And there's no one waking up, and there's no one who's ever fallen asleep. When you see the nature of consciousness, you realize it has never actually been asleep. There was no I that fell asleep. The one who is asleep and needs to awake is in the dream. The dreamer and the dream are one. And the guy in the dream doesn't wake up. The one wakes up to the entirety of the dream. The Buddha made a very amazing statement. He said that when I attained Samyak, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the great unparalleled uh, enlightenment, simultaneously all beings attained the great unparalleled enlightenment. And the Bodhisattva vow makes the, uh, another mysterious statement. It says, suffering beings are numberless. I vow to save them all. And having saved all beings, no being was saved. As the, as the sense of awakening deepens and the and the sense of their of of their being too and oneness grows we begin to break down the barrier between ourself and others that we we simply do not see someone as being asleep and awake or their story or, or my story the entire thing was a very elaborate image to consciousness which is one so it wasn't a you that woke up. Nobody woke up because nobody was asleep. The image in the mind of somebody who is asleep and needs to wake up is nothing but an image in the mind. It is a projection of the mind and doesn't actually exist. So the experiencing of awakening is part of the dream. And then you realize no one has ever actually been asleep because conscious awareness has been conscious awareness the entire time, completely aware of this. God, I hope that doesn't buzz by you too much. Um, the, the, the direction to go is, is, is deepen the sense of consciousness and be constantly challenging the very subtle ways in which the sense of being a separate individualized person or an individualized consciousness continues to surface in thought, sensation, and emotion. It's not real. It's not true. It's not what's actually true. What's actually true is the consciousness that you are is the one and only infinite consciousness that is beyond all space and time beyond definition, formless, nameless. And, but that is what you actually are. It's not a you discovering themselves to be consciousness. It's a, it is pure, infinite consciousness discovering that it is not this you. Completely the opposite, I know, but 
Thanks, Walt. I, I hope that does, is that am I am I closer? I know you've been <laughs> you've uh, been trying to find an answer. Are we getting closer? I mean, I know it's pretty out there. We've gone pretty far down the rabbit hole, but um, Uwe Dubai says, "Give examples, please." I'm not sure what that's referring to. Uh, Remington, as always, you are pointing me back where I need to be. <laughs> yes, and uh, I'll keep doing it until you don't need me to do it anymore. <laughs> uh, Rami says, does enlightenment simply mean when one does not anymore identify with the ego and, and thought and to just be? Um, yes and no. Um, yeah, when consciousness liberates itself from the sense of being a separate self, um, that is the egoic mind, the sense of being a separate self. That I, you're not the thoughts, you're not the emotions, and you're not the and you're not the body, you're not the sensations. And you even see that the body doesn't even exist as an object; that it's simply the experience of sensation, which is consciousness. Um, that is an awakening, but the awakening is not a a thing, <laughs> and it's a it's a con constantly unfolding uh, thing, deepening thing infinitely unfolding which is sounds strange because how does the absolute the ap pure the the perfect unfold well it does that's the mystery it is both it is both complete and continuing it is both perfect and continuing to evolve um, consciousness itself doesn't doesn't need any perfecting uh, the manifestation doesn't need any perfecting but the manifestation is constantly is the is constantly un, unfolding so um so don't think of it as being this this final moment because it's not it doesn't exist in time and just and that's good because you you don't want to say oh enlightenment is when this and this and this happens no because then you're going to miss the enlightenment you're already already experiencing right now which is simply your awareness of of everything Right? The awareness, the consciousness that's hearing my words right now is the enlightenment. And it's, we're simply r gradually realizing that that consciousness is my true identity and that it's not localized, it's not bounded, it's not a person, it's not someone in particular, there aren't a bunch of them. And so just simply let that grow so that you begin to realize that the enlightenment has already happened. You wouldn't be listening to somebody talking about this stuff in a satsang if it hadn't. So it's it is unfolding. You're not achieving it. It self-realization is the realization of what's always been true. And it is all and the self-realization doesn't come from something that isn't true. It doesn't come from a person. Truth realizes itself. Consciousness realizes itself. Unconsciousness can't realize anything. Thoughts can't be, don't think themselves. Emotions don't feel themselves. Sensations don't sense themselves. It all revolves around consciousness. And so the sense of identity, the sense of I, just continues to sink into the infinitely deep ocean of conscious awareness. And so that enlightenment doesn't become a future event you're hoping for. It becomes... A, a, a constant, perpetual, already present reality that you become increasingly aware of. Does that, does that help you guys? Does it help you, Rami? King Jesus Channel. What you say is good, but how can we escape the trap in the outer, on the outer side that directs soul into specific places like hell and heaven? Um, hmm. Well, judging from the name King Jesus uh, Channel, you have a perspective about this um, that is that is Christian in nature. I would say this: what we think of as the soul is an individualized consciousness. Right? You don't have a soul; you are the soul. Right? <laughs> that which is hearing my words that is aware of everything, is you. 
that qualifies for the soul. Call it consciousness, call it awareness, call it the sense I am. The only thing I would say is that there aren't souls. There's only one soul, and that soul is, is what you would call God. The I am is the one soul. And so my sense, my personal sense of identity, the sense of a separate self, as long as I cling to that, it's going to have all sorts of experiences, some heavenly, some hellish. It's going to have lifetime after lifetime. It could end up, in, uh, and it's not just Christian, other traditions too, even some Buddhist traditions. You know, you can get reborn in a heaven, you can get reborn as a hell being, you can get reborn as a hungry ghost, right? So whether it be a, you know, a, a heaven or hell a afterlife, and, and the whole idea that it's permanent, that it's, you know, a one-time shot, you're in hell, you can never get out again, that was made up by the, by the Roman Empire to control people. It's not true. <laughs> There's no truth in it whatsoever. Um, we create our own heavens and, heaven and hell simply by, by, by our ignorance, by identifying ourselves with that which is not true. And we discover the, the true nature of heaven when we discover that the true nature of soul is soul with a capital S. That soul is what we refer to as God. And our sense of being separate from that one soul, separate from God, is the fall. And that is the essence of all, all of our suffering. So there's nothing external directing you to heaven or hell. It is only, it is only our own ignorance uh, that that starts from the premise that you know there's God there somewhere and and, and I'm here God's good and I'm not um, that creates the sense of a of a of a hell or a heaven of a bliss a pleasure or pain and and suffering and the true nature of heaven is the bliss of self realization realizing that there's only one self that the one conscious being the great I am is the God of the universe, and that that is your true nature, and that the nature of the God of the universe is, in fact, self-conscious awareness. I hope that answered it for you, King Jesus Channel. I um, hope that's satisfying for you. Keith says, try thinking of it like this. Try explaining wetness or a fish or water to a fish. Right, yeah, no concept. Yes, Keith, there, there's no hell or heaven. No, there's no hell, objective hell or heaven. And see, that's what you think, just because I believe it doesn't mean it's, just because you believe it doesn't mean it's true. Absolutely not. And if we're really going to be true to our spiritual, we, uh, to our spiritual path, no matter what that might be, we need to find the way in which to discern things are true. And it's got to go beyond logic, it's got to go beyond reason, it's got to go beyond studies, it's got to go beyond technological instrumentation, it's, and it's got to go beyond just taking something because it says so in Scripture. You know, we, we have to come to the way where we find out what truth is. That's my two cents to throw in, it, and throw in that. Uh, Rami, King Heaven just means when one understands what you really are. That's what hell religion points to, and hell is just when one identifies with the ego and thought. Agreed. Robert Hill says, have you ever listened to Alan Watts? Yes. Yes, he's wonderful. I like listening to you or Watts before going to sleep. Um, TBH, maybe I'm avoiding silence by listening to you guys whenever I'm alone. That's a good, that's a good question, because I, I, I would just check in. Right? It's really simple. Just really check in because, of course, you, you want to listen to, <laughs> to teachers who are, who are uh, waking you up, who are pointing you in the right direction. But we do need, but you know, you can become, you can use, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to another Advaita talk uh, as a way to avoid what you're feeling. So uh, be willing to be present, simply present with the silence. So that you can clearly discern, is this, is this a need for some, from some new input, for some new inspiration? Or am I simply avoiding, am I trying to avoid this, this discomfort 
Um, it's an important thing to examine. There's no hard and fast rule to uh, say when you are, when you aren't. You just get really good at discerning it because there is a qualitative difference between the two. Um, and the more you spend time with it and, and, and really allow yourself to experience the taste of both, the clearer it is it will become the easier to be able to discern when it's just eh, I'm uncomfortable and I, I want to grab onto something um, or there's a genuine question that has arisen that is reaching reaching for an answer so thank you for noticing that it's very subtle and you know I know a lot of uh, people that every moment is filled up with you know yet another Muji video or or, or me or Rupert Spire or Francis Lucille or Rajashanti, um, rather than simply actually, okay. I mean, I remember Muji saying, uh, saying, look, I've already told you everything you need to know. <laughs> and when you think about it, it's like, oh, that's true. I actually already know. So take some time in that silence to do the inquiry, to be with the discomfort and go, who is it that's uncomfortable? Who am I identifying with? Who am I thinking of as me that's uncomfortable, that's not at peace, that's lacking something, that isn't awakened, that is a struggling? I mean, all of a sudden, this picture, uh, the self image of yourself as the perpetual seeker will begin to emerge. Well, that's not me either. And then you can take another step further back behind that lens to see that, that that entire picture of the seeker, as good and as noble as it is, is also phenomenal, appearing on the screen of consciousness. And our sense of, of what consciousness is deepens. And the eye sinks more deeply into, that, into its true source, to its true home. Um, Barbara says, how do I, <laughs> happy and more grateful I've ever been in my life, now what, how do I manifest winning the lottery? Um, there's probably a way you can do it. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to be that uh, f focused about it. But I do know that when it doesn't matter to you whether you win or not, um, some magic things can happen. But it, it really has to be something. If winning the lottery would in fact slow down your awakening, um, it's not going to happen. So uh, you really need to get to the point where the, it, it becomes, an, how do I manifest, wouldn't it be good to manifest, the, to manifest winning the lottery? And wouldn't it be good to not manifest winning the lottery? When, they, when neither one of them is more attractive than the other, then you're free. Um... It's kind of a private conversation going on between a couple people here. I, I th think I'll just let them go. Um, um, hello, GP. If I am not the mind, not the body, then who becomes enlightened? Oh, if that isn't a Shanika from London. Shanika, that's the million dollar question. Who is it that actually gets enlightened? We think that we think this person, the separate self, somehow gets enlightened. No, it doesn't. Awareness awakes up, wakes up to itself. There is no who that gets enlightened. The who disappears in the enlightenment. Muji makes a beautiful statement. He says, the one who starts the inquiry does not finish the inquiry, but is finished by the inquiry. You find consciousness is not a person. And you are not this person. 
nobody is waking up, nobody is 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 becoming enlightened. Um, <laughs> that awareness simply is aware of itself. Wow! Thank you for that question. Hmm. Sanjeev says, thank you. Is there a way to come out of the ignorance of individual consciousness and realize the universal consciousness while being in the body? Um, I hope so. <laughs> yes. Yes, there is. It, yeah, and that's exactly what we're doing. Right? The, it's a belief that you're in the body. You don't have to come out of the body. You have to you come out of the belief in the body. You're not in the body. So you don't have to come out of it. But you do have to come out of your belief in the body, and you have to come out of believing yourself to be the separate self, which is identified with the body. That's what you have to come out of. You don't have to come out of anything other than a false belief, <laughs> which is not a great sacrifice, right? <laughs> you simply have to stop believing what you're not. In believing in something that isn't true. You don't, have to, you don't have to create the truth, right? said right in the beginning, truth is self-sustained. It's eternal. It's self-luminous. It's self-verifying. It doesn't need anyone to believe it in order to be true. So all you have to do is to come out of the beliefs about yourself and into the truth of yourself, which is eternal, which is the true mind, the true awareness, the true Consciousness. Great questions today. This is, this is fantastic. So, you know, whenever I point you back to, to just simply being with the sense of awareness, the sense of existence, that's exactly what I'm doing. Now, the mind says, well, yeah, there's got to be something else I do, right? i got to do some things. No, you don't. That's it. You come back to the place from which everything is being seen. And it just gets subtler and subtler and subtler so that you see that even the sense of identity is something that's being perceived. So it's on the other side of the, the lens. So consciousness is not that. Consciousness is not limited. Consciousness is not the person. Consciousness is not the seeker. Consciousness is not the one who wakes up. Consciousness is what is aware of all of it. And you just begin to see that every single sense of, their, of it being finite or a person or localized or, 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 any, or a problem or any thought becomes something appearing to consciousness. And consciousness becomes something inconceivable and imperceivable. But then the, the need to conceive or perceive consciousness disappears because it's what you are. And you find that you are experiencing it all the time. But not as a, me experiencing something as an object. It is simply me experiencing myself. That is self-realization. The true self realizing itself. Realizing I am not this person. The person never realizes that. Wow, these questions are deep today. Um, Akram Man Maznai. <laughs> wow. Uh, hi, Mr. GP. How can I concentrate to reach my goals while here in Yemen war and the economy situation not stable? Thank you, sir. Oh, my heart goes out to you, Akram. It, it really does. The stupidity in, of war, the ignorance and ego, in, in ego that it represents... Um, the reality is there is there is nothing but your own beliefs that limit you. So economic situations, um, war, all of those things do not limit you. Do not take them in as some kind of, and make them a law unto yourself that says, because this is happening, I cannot experience that, this. Because A is happening, I can't experience B. A is interfering with B. That is a belief 
being held by you and it will only be experienced as true because you believe it. There is not actually any causal connection between A and B. Now that said, I don't want to sound um, um, insensitive, right? Because obviously we all have to deal with circumstances, right? I mean, if you look at the situation in the U.S., it's not great right now. People like to think it is. <laughs> you know, it's great for Wall Street, which is sucking the, the economy uh, dry. But it, for the average American, it's not great. It's not certainly what it was when I, when I grew up. So we can't just, you know, ignore, make everything about my own thinking. We have to open up. To me, the, the condition of our world today is calling us all to step more deeply and take more and be more diligent about coming to know who we really are and to cultivate our deep compassion and wisdom. Compassion, wisdom, love, kindness is going to save the world. So cherish all of the goals that you have. All of, the de all of the desires that you have, all of the things that you want to, to, uh, to accomplish, to have. Um, and then let go of your attachment to it and just love what's in front of you here and now, however it might appear. Find whatever good, find whatever kindness, give whatever kindness. So it's not you know, like you deny your aspirations, Right? But they don't become the be-all and end-all. You know, our desires, our aspirations, the things we want for our life are totally natural to us. They're as natural as the color of our hair or our eyes. They're not something you can get rid of. They're not something you choose. So your desire for certain goals in your life uh, ar arise. But the sense of lack, which is inherent in the sense of a separate self, sees an arising desire and goal as something that I, I'm lacking and I need to acquire. The truth is that lack is a false belief and that the desire and the fulfillment are one, unfolding over time. And if you simply let go of your attachment to the goal and enjoy the arising of the desire and then be completely present with what is here and now in front of you, you will be living the very energy that will manifest in, in the future at in, in some point. Because you can't start from a point of view of lack and expect to get abundance in the future. You know, tomorrow is built out of now. Whatever is the leading dominant quality that you're experiencing uh, now is the quality that is going to grow into whatever comes next. So it's all about cultivating the, the highest qualities we can in this moment. And for me, that's love, compassion, and wisdom. It's very simple. So you know, turn the other cheek. Forgive. Uh, do everything you possibly can to be the ideal that you seek to achieve. To live it as best you can right here with whatever resources are available in whatever circumstance you find yourself. That's how you get make the 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 royal road to to genuine manifested freedom. Mm. Uh, quickly excuse me one second my phone is uh, running out of juice my iPad still got plenty I'm going to have to plug in my phone because that's where I look to see all of, all of the questions. So, a little space track here for, for plugging it in. Thank you for your patience. It's a nice, long cable. Oop, there it is. Take it around my uh, fountain. All right.
plug it back in. Dunk. Beep. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, Keith says, yes, there is, understand. Okay, that's the private conversation. Akram, how, how can I oh, concentrate my career goal? Ari, is samadhi, this is coming from inner aesthetics, is samadhi the ability to observe the non-observable? Things outside the senses, including the sixth mind and emotions? Um, samadhi is a state in which... Um, Thought identification uh, has ceased. You're, it is simply pure experience. Right. Now, samadhi um, is not enlightenment, right? <laughs> um, samadhi is a state that can be. It's a technique that you can you can actually arrive to it. You can fall into it naturally, or you can learn to to do that. But it's simply that state where you are you are witnessing. Now it goes deep enough. The you see that everything you know about yourself is something that's being that is being witnessed, and eventually all of the seeds, the very subtle seeds of uh, of the separate self, uh, eventually can't grow anymore because there's no space for them any longer, and uh, and that's the experience of of awakening or enlightenment. Um, so samadhi. You know, whenever you are, uh, and you're doing it right now. I mean, the the, th the thing is, is this is always happening, right? You're always aware of your thoughts, aren't you? The thing is, we're identified with our our thoughts, and the and the thoughts when they when they use the word I, it's referring to another thought that we're identified with, that that the sense of self-image. So all we're doing, all you're doing in meditation or in samadhi, is that you are simply being aware of witnessing all of those without identifying with them so closely. Now there's still a subtle sense of being the witness as a as a person, as an individualized consciousness, and, and that, that that's okay. But if you can get to the point where you see that all thought, emotion, and sensation, which is the sum total of experience, is all being witnessed by consciousness, that those are all coming and going and consciousness is not, you are now heading in the direction of realizing yourself as consciousness. But it's subtle because the habit of identification with the form, with the body, the mind, feelings, sensations, um, is so strong that it's going to be recurring. Thoughts are going to constantly be re re coming up that I, you know, I'm, I don't like this, right? Well, that's not consciousness. Consciousness has no preference for anything. So that I don't like this, that I is referring to something else. It's not referring to consciousness. It's referring to the sense of a separate self. So it, it, it's a place from which we can deepen our sense of being pure awareness until all of the seeds of identity are finally burnt up and can't sprout anymore. So, you ask if it's the ability to observe the, uh, the non-observable. And that is what Muji refers to as non-phenomenal recognition. That is what I refer to as genuine self-knowledge. You, you, you are not you can't observe that which is not observable. You can't perceive that which is not perceivable. When we think of perception or observing as being one thing observing another, right, the subject and an object, but the subject cannot step outside of itself to observe it. And so the subject, the perceiver, the ultimate perceiver, the absolute truth, cannot be perceived because there's nothing to perceive it, because it is consciousness and nothing else is. That is, <laughs> the neti neti stand. Later it will become that, but for right now, right, thoughts are not, are not self-aware. There's only the, you're the self-awareness in the center of, of this whole thing. So, but you cannot know yourself or witness yourself or observe yourself as something witnessing 
something else. Everything else in the universe works that way. Self-knowledge does not. Self-knowledge is not witness looking at myself outside of myself because it's not possible. So this is where knowing and being coalesce into, the, into the, an ineffable, indescribable oneness. The mind can't go here. You simply, are, you know it because you are it. I do not have to tell you that you exist, right? You just know. But you're not sitting here looking at some kind of existing. You are that existence. And the only reason this is a bit shaky as you, as you ponder it, as you take it into your heart, is because the mind is no good here. The mind is, it, this is outside the realm of the mind. Because it is non-objective. It's non-phenomenal. There's not two things. There's only one. And so self-awareness does not is not me aware of myself. It is, it is awareness simply being aware. That awareness is being. Consciousness is what you are. <laughs> it is not an attribute of you. It is your very nature. It's even very difficult to talk about this. I hope I'm doing a, 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 a good job because it's extremely subtle. We're trying to point to something that can't actually be articulated. Okay. But you can see that, that the subject, the self, cannot stand outside the self and look at itself. So how, how do you know that you exist? You just know. The knowledge of your existence and your existence are one. Existence is the knowing of it. Is that? Oof. You guys are really, I like it, I like it, I like it. Um, Rosario asks, Hello GP, could you make me clear if vision is only something happening in consciousness? When I try to find who is watching the trees, I can't find anybody. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. It's what I was just saying. You can't find anybody. Because it's you. You're looking at the trees. We're just dropping the ideas you have about yourself, but who else would be watching the trees but you? Right? Who else is conscious of the but you? Consciousness is you. And that's why you can't find you, because you are you. You can't step aside and look at it. There's no subject-object relationship between yourself and yourself. Which means you are not a form. You can't be seen. You can't be detected. No one can see you because you're formless. You're boundless, spaceless, timeless, birthless, deathless. On and on it goes. So the fact that you can't find anybody is good. Because <laughs> if you found someone, it would be phenomenal, wouldn't it? There'd be you and the one that you found. You'd go, well, there you are. Got you. Got you. <laughs> no, you're not going to get away from me. Subject can't be you, can it? Which means that you are unknowable. Unknowable as an object. Knowable as yourself. In other words, the knowing of you and the being of you are one. Satchit and Ananda. Um, Saif. Hi, GP. I was just wondering... What do you experience personally in terms of your own awareness? What do you perceive, observe? Thank you so much and happy to see you. Happy to see you too. Um, same thing as you. Right? You know, if we were both sitting looking up in the sky and I knew that the earth was spinning, which gave the illusion of the sun moving, but you didn't. And you saw the sun moving across the sky and said, the sun is moving and I'm sitting still. We would both be looking at exactly the same phenomena, wouldn't we? We would both be having exactly the same experience. Nothing would be different. But I would be perceiving it as it actually is and you would be misperceiving it. You would be perceiving it uh, ignorantly. That's the only difference. The experience is the same but because it is not experienced um, as an objective phenomena, it, it, because it is experienced as consciousness, 
without a sense of a separate self, there's no suffering or pain in it. And things are seen for what they actually are, which is simply conscious, the dynamic aspect of, of the infinitude of consciousness. It's the only difference. So the experience... Uh, no different. I still love. I still, you know, you know. If I bump my knee, I go ah and say bad words. Um, <laughs> you know, I still sneeze. Uh, I, you know, right. So I mean, there's no difference. There's absolutely no difference. It has nothing to do with the the content of consciousness. It's the eyes through which it's seen. You're no longer looking at it through the eyes of a personal self. You are looking at it through the eyes of pure awareness, and so you see things as they are. Simple as that. Walt says, yes, it helps. Thank you as always. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, these deep questions, they're really deep, and sometimes I think, am I going too far? Am I explaining this right? Because the subtler it gets, boy, the harder it is to, to find the words and pointers and that sort of thing. You know, that's when I want to just take you to the cliff and push you over. <laughs> David Smith says, great satsang, great questions, great answers. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Dale Wiggins, am I essentially consciousness observing a physical brain learning to form the concepts you're speaking of? Um, that's a place where a lot of people start to realize that there's this body and it's functioning and the brain is doing stuff and the brain's this measurable thing, little things can light up and that sort of stuff and things can influence it and affect it. And yet it's clear that consciousness is something qualitatively different. It's consistent, it doesn't change, content changes, but the consciousness itself does not. It's, it, 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 it seems to be one rather than many different parts like the like the brain so it starts like that and your journey inward um, can move ahead but eventually you begin to question the whether or not what we experience is objective at all i believe that there's a body i believe that there's a brain but when i actually look at my direct experience without all the things that I've been told about what I am experience, experiencing, what I find is I am experiencing what is called sensation. Now it's called sensation because it's believed that it originates with a body. But while I can find the experience of a sensation, I cannot find the existence of a body separate from the sensation. Like I said uh, in the very beginning. The table is made of wood. No, the table is wood. Take away the wood and I can't find a table. Take away the sensation, I can't find a body. So does the body exist outside of the sensations as an object? My experience is, no, it does not. There is no body that is an object experienced in an objective universe, there is only sensation, which is movement in consciousness, because I am conscious of the sensations, but no body that is their source. Now, the moment I do that, I realize that the word sensation only refers to uh, something originating in the body. If there's no body, then there isn't a sensation. I'm only dealing with perception. Eventually you see it, you're only dealing with projections of mind, and then finally you see you're only dealing with consciousness, and that there isn't anything else. So it starts by, by just perceiving that consciousness is qualitatively different than anything else. It is assumed that someday we're going to find the little structure in the brain that is consciousness. <laughs> um, not been found so far. And so I, I reject assuming that we're going to eventually find it. Um, and I'm going to, until you find it. And even then I'm going to look at, well, what, the, the nature of consciousness is so qualitatively different than anything that has to do with matter. I have to entertain the idea that it is not material. That it is not in or of the body. That it exists independently of all the experience 
experience of it. And that's the inquiry I invite people to, to, uh, to, to, to go to, because you've already perceived consciousness is, is different. So then what's the brain? What's all, what's all this? What's all the functioning of the body? What is all of this stuff? Well, there are ways in which you can basically deconstruct all of that and find out that none of it exists. There is no body, there is no brain, there is none of this. They're all projections of mind. They're objects of consciousness and have no objective existence. What I would recommend for you is to explore consciousness as something independent of experience. Rather than actually explore it, because you can, because you're, you're that. You're, it, consciousness is as intimate as you can possibly get. It just can't be explored objectively. It has to be explored subjectively. We have to look at my own experience of being aware. And, <clears throat> and what gets included in that, what does not get included with that, and how all the objects that I'm experiencing, <clears throat> I'm only experiencing because they're in the awareness. I cannot separate the two. So you begin to really explore in depth with deep curiosity the nature of, of consciousness, but you're exploring it from the inside out, subjectively, because you can't explore it objectively. Nobody can. <laughs> so, hopefully that answers your question, Dale. Um, Sanjeev says, thank you again, Walsh, Walsh G. <laughs> it's a pleasure to talk to you and learn from you. I will trouble you again. Good. I want you to trouble me. Shake the waters. Oh, what time is it getting to be? I got about 10 minutes or so. Good. Um, oh my God, what a long list of questions. Okay. Um, now, sometimes I, I go through them qu pretty quickly. Sometimes they, they need a little bit more. Oh, excuse me. Where'd that come from? Sometimes they need a little bit more uh, uh, in-depth commenting. Uh, but, boy, we really hit on some extremely subtle and fine points today. Thank you. Thank you all for, for, the, uh, for the questions. Um, Sophie Austin says, I have been inquiring with inner reconciliation. Uh, very helpful to help the nervous system rest. I realized that I needed the contraction to go to be to go to be truth. I was figuring I was fighting, but nothing needs to change. Uh, that is correct. Yes, I realized that I needed the contraction to to go to be truth. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yes, y yes. We need adversity to <laughs> turn our attention inward. I hate to say it, you know, if your life was heavenly all the time, you would have no interest in seeking the truth. You must experience suffering in order to, to, in order to, to muster the discipline and the motivation to seek the end of suffering. That's why Buddha said that this, the human being, this place in the middle, is the, is the only place that where enlightenment can be attained can't be attained in the in the heavenly realms it can't be obtained attained in the hell realms it can only be attained here this is the perfect middle way the perfect balance point where we experience both right and of course we want to cling to one another we want to push away the hell and we want to hold on to, to the heaven but that Attachment and aversion is the cause of suffering. That's what needs to be seen through. According to the story of Buddha's enlightenment, after his enlightenment, all the beings, heaven beings, hell beings, hungry ghosts, everybody in the universe came to hear the Dharma being taught. Right? It, only here. So, yes, the contraction you feel when it is no longer avoided and try to be pushed away, and, and clinging to feeling good. And instead, you become increasingly present with whatever it is that is in, is in contraction for whatever reason. You've created the safe environment, and you now open the door to a reconciliation with it. And when you've created a safe environment, the whole reason it's contracting has been taken away, so the contraction can uh, lessen. But you're absolutely right. 
um, the point of that is not to simply uh, is not the point of inner reconciliation is not just to be another another clever way in which you uh, you get rid of bad feelings. It's a complete shift in the relationship with the feelings. So you see, they're not bad at all. That the bad has all been the story you've had about them, and it's the story you've had about those feelings that's created your suffering. And so we need adversity. We need to be pushed to the wall. <laughs> we absolutely must. You know, Muji says, you get to the point where you've run out of mo moves. There's no place left to turn, right? Something happens there. A shift in consciousness takes place. A surrendering takes place. Um, that is a, an opening of the heart as much as it is the mind and the vision. So um, thank you for this grace, GP. You're very welcome, Sophie. I hope that answers your question. Um, Starlight Glimmer says, if there's no objective reality, is it possible to manifest a new reality, like just start over? Or is that bad to focus on desire like that? Did our egos decide the current state of the universe? No. The ego is a sense of self, a false sense of self, that is projected on the universe. And this is why the whole idea of, of you know, the whole idea of law of attraction and, and manifestation is a very watered down, almost perversion of this. Because to realize that the, the, there is no objective reality should inspire you to, oh my God, this is, it's like the solution of the great mystery. But when it's first grasped, that sense of separate self is still there. And so it jumps up and goes, oh, that means I can get whatever I want. I can manifest my own universe? That's great. And now, in fact, if that line of reasoning continues, the ego gets stronger. It gets empowered. And especially if some people have the experience where they do that and it does get manifestations do occur, which it does. If you believe it strongly enough, it's going to happen. But that isn't the truth. Remember, I started this whole satsang with discerning what's true and what's a belief. So I believe I can manifest, then I can manifest. I am no closer to the truth. As a matter of fact, I'm farther away because I think I've got it now. <laughs> As I just got through saying, there's wisdom in, in adversity. So it is possible to, to do an entirely new reality. But in order to do that, you have to be the reality. Because what you're saying, create a new reality, you're actually saying, I'm going to create a different experience. The I that wants to create a different experience is simply an I that doesn't like this one. It wants something different. It has an aversion to this and has an attachment to something else. You are right smack dab in the middle of the egoic mind. Attachment and aversion are the, are the smelly socks of the ego, right? <laughs> True consciousness has no preference. And it isn't it, and, and the creation of awareness is simply the nature of awareness constantly expressing itself. It is not like this conscious entity think, I think I'll create this now. It's more like, you know, the, the good musician, the great musician, like a jazz musician that is a, a brilliant improviser, they're not sitting there thinking, I think I'm going to make this now. It is just happening, coming out of their own nature. The manifest universe is simply just happening, arising out of the nature of the essence of all things, the, the ultimate source energy, which is consciousness. The sense of a separate self projects upon that universe um, its idea of what that universe is. And of course, the sense of being separate from it, the sense that this is a... The, me here in the universe over here, there's this, I'm, I want it to be different. I don't like it. <laughs> I want it to be different than it is. I'm going to change it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to visualize. I'm going to, whatever. Uh, really turn your attention towards whatever it is that is not happy now, that thinks things should be different. And then see how that is simply an activity of the egoic mind. And then you can drop it. 
And now the question of manifestation doesn't, it isn't a personal possession. It isn't an attempt to fix your life. It becomes the natural consequence of simply being aligned with the truth. So you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to, to worry about it. Manifestation is like the wake on a boat. It's going to happen, but it has nothing to do with where you're headed. Matter of fact, if you're, if you're really focused on where you're headed, you're, you're barely even going to notice there is a wake, even if it's a big one. Hope that helps you there. Dun, dun, dun. Keith says, GP, if I think of someone and they come into my mind, is that a manifestation of my mind? Or me hearing them? Or a conscious connection to that person? It's kind of all of all of the above. You know, like, as I was pointing out early, earlier, the consciousness is not localized. We have a sense of me here, here and, and, and there, they there. That's <laughs> um, an illusion. Consciousness is one. Their thoughts, my thoughts. It's just this particular set of thoughts in consciousness has kind of dense, become more dense, you know. It's kind of like water freezing in a certain place. Now you got this iceberg floating in the, in the, what looks like an individualized consciousness is simply consciousness that has condensed as a little denser over here. And so it looks like an individual. And it's not. <laughs> it's just more dense of the same thing, right? <laughs> That's all it is, right? And so because it's all one field, one, just one fluid field of consciousness, there's no better way to put it, there really is no obstacle between you, you and them. So, am I hearing their thoughts? Are they hearing my thoughts? Are we both hearing the same thought at the same time? Um, all of these are just very interesting ways of trying to explain the, the phenomena of what you're talking about, somebody coming to mind and then they call you or uh, something, but trying to explain it from the point of view of being a separate person with their and their thoughts over here and me and my thoughts over here, how did that connection take place? As a matter of fact, you know, a lot of the experiments they've, they've done with meditation around the world and how it influences things, that even though every, they really see that there's this subtle connection between all things, they still think that all the things are different. Whereas when you see it as consciousness, you, see, you don't have to explain that phenomenon anymore. You realize it's just a phenomena, and that we're both, you know, we're like it's like two radios tuned to the same station. It's it's all coming from the same place. The only thing that has to be overcome is the sense of a separate self, which is interpreting all of this experience, and then getting kind of kind of either whacked out when it gets when it when the experience gets really myst mystical like you know like extrasensory perception knowing things you shouldn't know remote viewing you know psychic abilities it those only are mysterious from the point of view of a separate self take that out of the question and go well yeah of course <laughs> of course i know the past the present and the future of course i know the 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 the, everything around me. Of course there's no real walls between. There's really no privacy. <laughs> but I don't need it because there's nobody else. To, well, I don't go there. <laughs> um, Ava says, I also love listening to you or other invited teachers because when doing this, I avoid the discomfort of silence and emptiness. But you have just made me realize that this comfort belongs to a separate person which is not truth. Yes, the person does not like this. Yes, yes, the person doesn't like it. The person has all sorts of preferences. I don't like the discomfort. Well, awareness, in order for, in order for the, the thought, I don't like this discomfort to come up, I want to do something else, in order for that to come up, the feeling of discomfort had to already got in there. So awareness has already said, okay, here it is. And now there's a, there's a cascading of events, part of the conditioning. This feeling comes up and there's a reaction to it. All of that is being allowed by the presence awareness, which has no issue with any of it. The more you realize that the, that the thought that says, I don't like this, is all there is to the separate self. There's not actually a separate self that has this thought that the thought is referring to a separate self that doesn't actually exist. So it's just the thought. 
I don't like this, without any I that actually doesn't like it. So it's just a feeling and thought. When you see that, you just sink into the awareness and the, it can all just come and go, come and go, come and go. And then we can actually discern what, you know, what's, what's, what's to do right now and what's not. What's, what's the right moment for me and what's not. And on on this on the relative plane, but it's coming from the 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 deep uh, <clears throat> recognition that you are that which is aware. You are not that you are what you are aware of, and that the separate self does not exist. It is only a thought a thought that other thoughts revolve around. When you see it doesn't exist, all those other thoughts that have been revol revolving around this one thought, just kind of, first they freak out a little bit, <laughs> and then they just dissolve. Because they, and then new thoughts will begin to organize around the true sense of awareness. It doesn't mean that thought stops, it simply means its character changes, because thought is reactive. It's not. It's. It, 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 it only. It only conforms to whatever whatever center it's revolving around. If it's revolving around the true self, you get what in Buddhism they call the great perfect mirror mind. So. Um, you know, somebody's walking around in the woods of Norway while I'm listening to this. Experience is gradually getting more pure, and suddenly my awareness explodes outside in every direction, completely open. Awareness outside the body. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. Yes. <sighs> yes. The imaginary boundary is dissolving, and it is imaginary. There isn't a you and a them. There isn't a, a me and, a, and an other. There is, only the, there is only the one infinite divine I. And on that note, I think I will let it go for now. It's been... Uh, uh, yeah, it's been my two hours. So, if I didn't get your question, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but please know that I do always say the same thing over and over again. <laughs> the questions are different, but I'm always pointing to the same place. Um, two weeks, finally separate and stuck person. Hmm. It's always the same answer because the question is always the same. Who am I really? And all of the problems, all of our suffering arise from the identification with something that you're not. A self-image you're holding, a self-portrait that you have that you really believe to be you but isn't. <clears throat> the coming to see that in an increasingly deep and profound way is the path to enlightenment, is to awakening, to enlightenment. And and it isn't that you get to enlightenment. The only reason on you're on the path is because the enlightenment already happened. <laughs> Something already opened and said, this is true. The real you is saying, this is true, and is reaching for it. So it's not that at some point enlightenment happens. Enlightenment is happening. It's simply unfolding over time, the experience over time. So... Please like and share. <laughs> I always forget to mention that now that, now that it's at the end. Um, we are planning for all of my uh, donors, people on Patreon or on PayPal who have donated. I am. We've been trying to set it up. Just scheduling has gotten kind of crazy to do a private satsang just for my uh, uh, donors where it'll be on video where we can actually talk and not just, um, not just uh, uh, texts. Uh, you know, the chatting kind of thing, which actually is better. It helps me refine it a little bit and interact with you more, whereas the question just kind of stands by itself when it's a chat, but I can actually dig a little bit more if we're talking in person. Um, so that'll be coming up this week or the next. 
Um, so um, anybody who, uh, you know, believe me, these donations help. So I keep this commercial free and I can, you know, pay for all the stuff you see around me. Well, you know, it's all around here now. To, uh, to keep this going, I can continue to um, charge the minimal amount for the courses and stuff that I do. So uh, if you'd like to, um, you know, Patri Patreon is just a, is, is just for those who want to like do a subscription, like a dollar a month or a million dollars a month, whatever you prefer. Um, uh, you can find that at gpwalsh.com slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Um, if you want to make a one-time donation, I do that, I can do that through PayPal and that is, uh, gpwalsh.com slash donate. And, uh, you can also do a, uh, uh, a subscription uh, one on PayPal as well. So both both of those will work. So that's what it works. So um, it is extremely helpful to me. I, you know, I have, I keep hoping the number gets up there that I can I can actually get a a, a place to do satsangs live because I don't really have a lot of a, a lot of room here to do it. Um, a regular place where I can put the studio and and make more videos and like, but all in due time. The important thing is that, that however it comes, that the the truth of your tr of your being, which is the truth, right? You and the truth are one, becomes clearer and clearer to everyone. That's why I'm here. Um, so you just said the credit card won't let me do a million a month. Well, uh, <laughs> well, thanks for trying. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> Um, you are the truth. You are simply discovering your true nature. That's why self-realization is, is such a great term for it. You're realizing who you've always been. The, 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 the veil is dropping from your eyes. And like I said before, it's not like anything actually changes. You know, we know that the, the sun is is static, at least relative to our solar system, and it, the spinning of the Earth gives the illusion of the sun going across the sky. So we know that's true. We still have the illusion there, the sun going across the, this, the sky. It, it still seems that way, but we know differently. We know that's not what it is. And the same thing is true with the awakening. Everything is experienced the same, but we simply know that it's not objective. It isn't what I had thought it was, that it is consciousness, not matter. And that just sinks more and more deeply into the heart because the net effect of that is that the more you realize that you are that pure consciousness, the happier you get. Just spontaneous, <laughs> um, uh, un, uh, uninvited, <laughs> completely, com completely self-sustaining happiness. So, on that note, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for, for wanting to participate in in this kind of a depth of a conversation. Thank you for the depth of the questions. I, I hope I was able to, to point you in the right direction. Until next time, love you all. Namaste.